All right, so um, one of the cool things, I guess, getting a, a good uh, flow and, and we're in front of a live audience, one of the coolest things to say is I get to introduce my friends. Um, I'm on with great folks and good people that I know. I'm literally standing beside my business partner, sitting beside my business partner's side, and we're here in front of the Frederick Dulles Mansion. Uh, we're, we're doing a property renovation, talking about sustainability. That's a person up there who's sustained and who led the way for sustainment. So we wanted to make sure we brought him uh, into it. And if you don't know, Frederick Dulles is one of the first United States Marshals and one of the most pictured and famous uh, abolitionists who stood for something, realizing that there was an interstate trade of people. Um, and so I want to introduce some great people. I want to introduce uh, Jasmine Aguilar, the working group president, a good friend of mine. She is uh, the vice president now, passed off, vice president now of the Minority Cannabis Business Association, um, a, a, a true powerhouse uh, in working to get reform for minorities in the industry and engaging in business. Uh, we're also uh, welcoming in Adam Smith. This is a maven, a guy who has been in this industry and, and working around the industry to help uh, better uh, the, the industry for the better part of the last 17, 18 years now, I believe. Um, Adam can correct me if I'm wrong, but he might be mad at if I'm calling him too old. Uh, but that being said, Adam's here is definitely going to bring the Craft Cannabis Alliance out to talk about some of the policies and practices and what we're looking at pushing forward uh, to the next level. And to my right, that guy over there uh, is my business partner, Todd Hughes, amazing mind, nuclear engineer by trade, uh, freedom fighter, process manager for all uh, by craft. Um, he's also the chairman of the board for the Minority Cannabis Business Association, uh, a really preeminent group working to fight diligently, diligently excuse me, for the laws for minorities and, and understanding what a minority is, those with disabilities, those with challenges, females, women, excuse me, women, uh, African-Americans, Latinos. Uh, there's a lot of things that make you a minority and being able to participate in this industry um, is a right. And then myself, uh, Brandon Wyatt, I'm a guy that likes to take the trash out. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade. Um, I'm a soldier by craft. And uh, so being able to be here representing some of the We for Warriors project, some of the good folks that I know uh, who's worked on sustainment and being able to be here as the secretary of the Board of Minority Cannabis Business Association is an honor. Um, please forgive a little bit of the background noise. I hope the birds are, are well, but I want to give the panelists a quick second to say hello and, and with some uh, a little bit about themselves. So Jasmine, ladies first. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine Aguiar. Um, I've been in the industry for about nine years now and um, currently based out of Los Angeles, California. And in Los Angeles, um, I've been able to um, actively help shape a, the um, cannabis programs all over LA County and at the state level. I'm also a um, license holder for a distribution and transportation license. So the interstate trade is definitely something that I've had my eye on since the inception of legalization because I think it is so important once um, interstate commerce opens up and um, hopefully national um, legalization will open up sometime soon, um, we'll have the ability to use these transport and distribution channels from California and be able to bring um, resources and product from California to all across the United States and maybe someday internationally as well. I'm happy to be in this panel. As Brandon um, mentioned, I'm also um, the vice president of the Minority Cannabis Business Association. And one of my main roles is to help shape our programming um, and policy making at a local, state, and federal level. And a lot of what we do is have these types of conversations where we discuss what obstacles are do we see right now as minorities and as the supply chain in the industry, and how can we actively um, create policy that will open up these channels so that we can continue to grow. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. This is a, a great panel and a really interesting um, topic. Uh, my name is Adam Smith. I'm the founder and president of the Alliance for Sensible Markets. We are a coalition of business and advocacy leaders um, pushing for the opening of interstate commerce uh, through interstate agreement um, without waiting for federal legalization, which of course we support, but um, it is uh, still an open question about when that happens. Uh, I'll talk more about that. My background, I come out of the movement uh, more than the industry. 
it's actually been more than 17 or 18 years. I got involved in the movement in 1992 and I got involved professionally uh, in 1996. Um, I, I started uh, the first uh, publication that covered drug policy uh, from the reform side back in 1996 and then uh, helped launch the uh, Students for Sensible Drug Policy, which some of you may have heard of, which is now in uh, 30 countries. And I come to the industry, um, you know, talking about interstate commerce, uh, I like to say sometimes that uh, what I'm doing is a, is a movement uh, is a movement project masquerading as an industry initiative. Um, and there are reasons uh, uh, with justice and economics and the environment um, and equity uh, not to wait for federal legalization and not to allow uh, 20 more states to set up siloed state markets. And we'll talk more about that and how we're going to um, address that and move the issue forward. Uh, like I said, without waiting for federal legalization, I'm excited to talk about it. Hey everyone, Todd Hughes here. Uh, I appreciate Brandon introducing me uh, that way. Uh, he's a, a business partner and a friend, and um, we've been in the cannabis space since uh, a friend of ours was kicked out of school for less than an ounce of cannabis, uh, lost federal financial aid and housing, and from there, uh, I jumped in as a, a, a advocate, um, a philanthropist in the space, um, making sure my friends. Uh, stayed out of trouble, stayed out of prison, and actually had opportunities to uh, participate in this market uh, in the cannabis space. Um, ultimately, my background is mechanical engineering and I'm a federal government employee for a number of years, uh, GS-15 level. Um, but on the side, I, I felt that I had to risk it all to make sure that my friends were safe and that I understood uh, how this market and I helped shape how this market has uh, come about. So um, the, the, the work we've done has been specifically in developing um, small minority businesses, fighting for social equity and finding um, pathways to uh, legitimate and uh, successful, profitable business. Um, my company, Entrevation, Entrepreneurship Innovation, is a business development firm. Um, we've worked with a number of, of cannabis operators and was fortunate enough to become uh, tied in as an operator ourselves, as a social equity applicant in, uh, in Maryland, and we have ties to West Virginia as well. Uh, and very interested in the interstate commerce complex and how uh, these policies can be shaped and formatted such that uh, it's a, a equitable space and uh, there's opportunities for all and uh, there's, there's solid regulations put in place so that we can safely operate in this industry. That's me. Hey, wonderful everyone. Sorry to jump in late. I'm Zach Carson and I'll help you guys moderate this panel. Um, sorry to jump in late. Have we got through everyone's introductions on here? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Well, pleasure you're, to you're never late it. when you jump in at the end of the line right then, Zach. We're, we're glad to have you, man. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. You know, Brandon, uh, I've got, I heard you at one of the INCBA webinars talking with Adam Smith, and uh, it's a pleasure to have all four of you up here right now. Uh, maybe we'll just start out with a little bit of background. Maybe Adam Smith, I know you, you've really been one of the forefront leaders of pushing this movement forward, and maybe you can just give us a little background as to uh, why you, you became so passionately involved in this and where things sit with the conversation right now. Um, sure. Welcome, Zach. Good to have you. <laughs> uh, so the first thing that, that we need to understand, and, and it's unfortunately not often fully understood even within the industry, is that when, when federal legalization happens, interstate commerce will happen. Um, the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution, among other things, keeps states from engaging in trade wars with each other. Uh, and like I like to say, you know, Florida can't keep California oranges out of its market, even if it wanted to. Um, and so when federal legalization happens, uh, the walls will come down between states. Now, right now, we are moving toward a situation where we have multiple states and soon to be many more setting up siloed production industries. And um, it, it, it almost goes without saying that there are places in the country that are uh, environmentally uh, more um, amenable to growing cannabis at scale. Um, also, there are places in the country where it's less expensive to grow cannabis at scale. And as we head down toward 15 or 18 or 20, some uh, state siloed production industries, 
when those walls come down and cannabis starts coming into those markets from places where it's grown more efficiently and better, uh, most of that investment in production is going to become obsolete. Um, and so we are, so the future of this industry is interstate commerce. The problem is uh, that we don't know when that future is going to happen. Uh, right now, you know, there's a big push in DC for federal legalization, uh, but there's uh, every reason to believe that it will not happen in the 2017th Congress. We have no idea what the, what the 218th Congress is going to look like after the 22 midterms. And so we are left sitting and waiting for a future of the industry that we can see, but we are, we are building the industry in a direction that is not, uh, that is not commensable with what, with what the industry is, is going to be. Um, let me just also say that the impact right now of these states setting up uh, siloed markets are that um, is that a small number of large producers uh, who have 50 or $80 million to put into giant grow facilities uh, end up dominating these markets. Um, they're the easiest ones to license. Uh, they, you know, if, if states want to get some sort of supply chain up and off the ground quickly, or at least marginally quickly, uh, they will license the large producers. Um, but, uh, and they will sell lots of cannabis, you know, while those walls are up for the highest prices those states will ever see. Uh, but the but the actual um, sustainable opportunities in a state like New York or New Jersey or Arizona uh, is not in large scale production. It's in retail, distribution, delivery, product development, manufacturing, wellness, hospitality, right? And so, and all of those levels of the trade, which are far less capital intensive for the most part than large scale production, therefore easier for small businesses and equity businesses to get it to get into, um, sit and wait for years while a small number of companies figure out how to grow cannabis at scale in places where that's never happened before. Um, and so uh, to wrap up, I know I don't wanna to take too much time and jump right in, but uh, we in 2019 in Oregon, we wrote and passed a law allowing the state to enter into interstate agreements um, for the purpose of regulating uh, commerce and cannabis. And that bill, that law has a federal trigger. It says Oregon can execute th these agreements when the federal government either gives permission via statute or indicates tolerance via Department of Justice memo or policy statement. And so where we are right now is we are working in states and we believe that getting governors uh, out front um, on this will not, it will move the policy forward and further, and then I'll stop talking. Um, President Biden has been very clear and on 420, Jen Psaki, his, his spokesperson was asked the cannabis question. And the first thing she said, was that President Biden uh, supports the states in making decisions around, uh, around recreational legal cannabis. And uh, she went on to say that he is not uh, in favor of federal legalization, which we know. And so we believe that if governors go to the, ju the Biden Justice Department and say, we wanna regulate trade between our states in cannabis to bring in revenues and move millions of people out of illicit markets here sooner, that the Biden Justice Department will issue a memo or statement allowing that to happen. And so that is our push right now. Awesome. Thank you for that uh, history and, and, and so much of your leadership there. Um, you know, part of, you know, this obviously the sustainability symposium uh, and, you know, I think the sustainability concept touches a lot of different uh, aspects. It touches the energy, it touches the waste, it touches the water, it teaches financial business, and it also touches the social equity uh, components of, you know, of how this affects community. Um, last time you talked, Brandon, I was really amazed at your perspective in interstate trade and, and what that will do in from the social equity lens. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about kind of your perspectives there and the work you're doing um, to, you know, affect policy and, and sort of work, work with, tell us about how you're working to create a just sort of interstate, you know, opportunity? Um, thank you for that. And, and going after speaking after Adam is so uncomfortable for me. Um, I have so much respect for him. He's such a maven. Um, and many of much of his work I've read and taken my mind to push push past where some of the, the, the typical constraints of where we've seen a cannabis business and as he's trying to say, just see business. And when you start just seeing business and understanding some of the barriers that existed um, when we spoke at INS and BA, it was a, I, won't, I don't want to say a different level of a conversation, but an extremely high legal level of starting to break. That was a continuing legal uh, course. So INS and BA, 
uh, Cannabis Certification Council, you guys got it going on right now, because the education of the history of how different legislation um, has worked using minority interests to break down interstate trade as being identified as tools of racism comes with the Hart v. Uh, Hotel Atlanta case. Um, we also look at cases like Gonzalez v. Reich, which look at uh, 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 the opportunity for interstate trade to be accomplished um, without using restrictive natures upon racist, racist provocations or, 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 or anything in the barrier uh, in uh, between, excuse me for the noise. Uh, we're here live in front of Bergen Bowes Convention. But that being said, um, when we look at the policy work, it's really to normalize the conversation. Um, many people don't understand what sustainability is. S sustainability is, is in, in an essence of, of the sustainment of a thing. To sustain something, you have to dissect all the parts. And because if not, you don't understand the collection of things. Yesterday we were speaking um, at Patients Out of Time about cannabis being a medicine. And then we get another understanding cannabis is a job. Then you get to another understanding cannabis is a food. You get to another understanding cannabis, hemp are products that you build with, right? You get to another understanding that someone's delivery service and then there's a software company. And so the understanding of sustainment that we're looking at from a policy level is how to really know the fact that from STEM education uh, uh, down, Native Americans, minorities, Latino Americans have been deprived of these educational opportunities. How do we use money from cannabis to ensure that they're brought, brought back in and not being highlighted as cannabis is a great savior, but it's something that can be looked at succinctly to level the field. Um, I had conversations with the Illinois regulator. She's a classmate of mine and friend, Danielle Perry the sole Illinois regulator. We found out some of the great things that innovative the things they're doing in Illinois, but we also understand that some of the funds that Illinois receives from the tax dollars go into the, the traditional uh, funnels of how they do city and state services. I'm not saying they're doing a bad job. I'm just saying they're doing the same job they were doing while the war they're doing the same job they're doing while the war doesn't happen and giving them more money to do the same job doesn't really add up we need to have succinct programs that are targeted looking at cannabis as a way to bring folks in and as a tool and resource to provide education information around the sustainable markets that support the cannabis industry and so that's one of some of the big work we do at mcba because it touches so much you'll hear from jazz she always checks me about what it's like to be working in the industry and she's senior to me working in the industry right even though that we're on the board we're friends I but um, I, I definitely, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was wrapping forward there because it really comes down to the bear of, of what Jasmine has to say and what Adam has to say and what Todd has to say because they dissect things. And when it comes back to me as a defensive player, I'm asking where are the holes at? Why is this not interoperable? And then the last lens that I look at it from is as a veteran. Um, we're the one sustained population that qualifies nationally for the same injury. We qualify for the same drugs. We're the only one that actually have universal health care that's supposed to be of a higher standard. And I'll, I'll be clear, I was turned up a little bit earlier and was crying and upset because no one can tell someone how much cannabis they need as medicine. There's, there's no dosing conversation. Like, yeah, we can practice dosing as a medicine, but a fibromyalgia patient, a PTSD patient, nobody can tell them how much it takes to make them feel better. And we talk about sustainability, the industry of how this is now gonna get paid for and how we're gonna have people who need to look at the government and say, hey, we need to pay you for some happiness. We need to pay you for giving us euphoria, a medicine that allows us to sustain in our daily lives, right? Who's gonna pay for it? So when we talk about sustainability, it comes all the way around. And, and um, that's really where I stand behind Jasmine and Adam and Todd on. Yeah, thank you for that, Brandon. And, um, you know, Jasmine, maybe maybe just to follow up on what he's saying, you know, you've been doing, seems a lot of your work in the LA area and, you know, California being some of the first entries into the cannabis market. Um, we've had the pleasure and the challenge of building it, the market as it's happening and other states now are, you know, getting to build their own markets. How do you see uh, the work you've done from a policy education perspective, being able to scale um, to these markets um, as they grow and with interstate, how do you see that being something, if it happened before federal legalization, being a tool to help those models that you've helped build uh, scale? Thank you. Thank you, Brandon, for that follow-up. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges I think is um, the miseducation of our regulated authorities. And I'm talking about authorities like the DOT, right? 
When we are a licensed distributor in the state of California, that means that my drivers can move up and down the state to transport products, whether it's from northern to southern or southern to northern, but we come in contact with checkpoints. And um, these checkpoints where, um, in, in other cases, DOT will do what they, they're required to do and let that shipment go through. When it comes to cannabis, that's not the case. We're having a lot of issues interstate, within our state to get product to move um, from, one, from point A to point B, right? So that, that's problem number one. When we're talking about scaling and expanding, we can use hemp as an example of what hurdles we're going to be facing. And we've been able to move products from California down to Southern states. But when you're crossing states like Colorado, you come in contact with authorities who know what's going on. These authorities are very familiar with the process and facilitate these types of transactions. But when you're you're crossing interstates in states like Texas, the case is very different, right? We've had shipments of hemp withheld in states of Texas, and our drivers held um, in in um, in jail because they're transporting in what these local authorities think is cannabis, right? And one, they don't have the um, the scientific backing or even labs to provide them with um, test results to prove that this is in fact hemp. So they in turn cost operators thousands of dollars from a misunderstanding and um, I think that that's definitely one of the things that the industry can um, come together and continue educating these government officials and um, regulating authorities on a federal level. We're talking about someone like DOT that is going to oversee all the, of these transport transactions we haven't um, had, as an industry, we haven't had enough contact with them. And we need to, um, one, be able to have these candid conversations. But then the, the follow-up issue that we have with that is how do we, um, how are we effective in that process when we're talking about regula regulation at a local, state, and federal level to allow this interstate commerce to happen, right? So our activism can be very effective in states like California, but we're not gonna get the same response like we will in, a, in Texas or in a state like Florida. Um, I think th those are definitely challenges that, that we foresee, um, we have been dealing with and it, it takes a lot of um, grooming to be able to do this. Uh, one of the things that MCBA has been focusing on is including these conversations um, at a state level. I think that we're still peeling that onion um, to see where we, we find these hurdles. I don't think that this is a conversation that is going to have impact in one year or two years because we've been doing this for multiple years right we're talking about maybe decades before we see some type of normalization into interstate commerce but it's definitely exciting i, I definitely think that as we face these challenges um, and we overcome these challenges then it, it, it grows it, it grows the industry to have better business practices and the way we handle these situations also proves um, to these regula uh, regulatory agencies that we do mean business and we are here to do things the right way. So I wanted to build on what Jasmine was talking about there because um, the concepts and ideas that uh, have been laid out about uh, interstate commerce and the gaps that were identified um, need to be kind of assessed. Uh, my background is like project management mostly and doing things in a sequential and strategic way is kind of the way I think about things. 
And so ultimately in this, this space, um, we have to look at some, some key references that we can tap into in order to help um, facilitate the process of education, um, laying out ground rules and, and opportunities for uh, governments to jump on board. If we ever take a look at some of the, uh, the, the compacts that are set up between uh, sovereign entities such as uh, the Indian uh, Native American nations, such as the one on the Tulalip in uh, Washington state. Um, they have a, a, a pretty solid compact established in 2017 that lays out um, the, the fine lines between uh, the state control and the uh, sovereign entities control of uh, cannabis commerce. And uh, it, it's signed in, 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 in operation. So why can't states have that same capability uh, in, in similar types of compacts where uh, we can un, you know, start to educate the, the, the legal system, the, the folks that are at DOT, the folks that are at the, the governor's level and individual cities need ordinances to understand how to engage and what's legal and what's not. And so I think that um, taking a look at that type of framework and, and maybe even doing a pilot um, and starting, starting there and, and figuring out ways to uh, stand up a, a, a equitable and sustainable kind of approach to interstate commerce. And those are the places where advocates like ourselves can interject and inject some of the uh, experiences that Jasmine just laid out. Um, what can we do to, to uh, mitigate those shortfalls um, at, the, at the borders or at the, uh, the, the checkpoints throughout the state um, and understand um, what we can do to make sure that uh, there's, there's uh, like I said, equitable policies. So if you, if you think about it, I've done a lot of work in the trucking industry over the last four or five years, and there's $761 billion of product that go over the state, um, over the streets of America uh, by itself. Um, and ultimately from there, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big pie there that uh, uh, can be split up and a lot of dollars that are available. I know Adam's uh, focus on social equity through uh, taxing the, the exchange uh, uh, of uh, product between states and providing that those dollars to uh, social equity programs is something that is of, of interest as, as well. And that can be part of these compacts that are established. So I'm excited about the, you know, the discussion and conversation, but at some point we need to start really doing some things like Adam said, get the governors together and uh, start building from there. Yeah, thank you everyone. I you know, just, just moving a little beyond that, um, I wonder, you know, there's such a challenge, you know, you, you think about California historically has provided close to 70% of the cannabis in the U.S. Uh, prior to legalization, and that's an area in the Emerald Triangle, approximately the size of Rhode Island with about, estimated about 55,000 cannabis farmers, and, and that was all the cannabis going throughout the U.S. Now, all of a sudden, we're seeing all these markets pop up. We're also seeing the California market not really expand and grow at the, at the capacity that we all thought it was for a lot of reasons, one of them being not enough retail locations to support the amount of supply, so demand isn't there. You know, as these other states become legal, we're already seeing in Michigan and Florida a lack of supply that can even fulfill their medical um, you know, requirements, and we're seeing you know, major greenhouse grows that are extremely energy intensive, building intensive, heat intensive, you know. Um, what is the tipping point that individual states would want to see interstate become a thing prior to federal legalization? And where does that pressure uh, come from? Is the pressure coming from states with excess supply or is the pressure coming from states with, you know, too much demand and not enough supply? How do you see that? This question's open to anyone, really. <laughs> it's, com it's coming from Adam. <laughs> Adam. I mean, let's, let's talk about that, Adam. Tell him about it. Tell him about uh, the pressure, Adam. So, <laughs> you're killing me, man. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, just to push back a little bit uh, on one thing that Jessica said, you know, we believe that we can get interstate commerce. We believe we can get at least two states um, bringing this to the Justice Department uh, for guidance. Uh, by early next year. And we think that the pressure is 
is going to have to come from the governors. Uh, we have in Oregon, we have a governor who has signed an interstate bill and supported it. Uh, our next, our next, um, our next move with with her, with Governor Brown, after our legislative session ends here, uh, is to start to push her to to, to make a public statement, um, saying that we are prepared to have these conversations with states, and that um, and that when those conversations happen, we will reach out to the Department of Justice for their guidance. Um, and really what it will take in the, in the, in California and Oregon, it's an easy sell, right? You have, you have capacity, you have the, the most important and best producing region on the planet and who has for generations supplied um, all of the major markets in this country uh, that are now shut into their states while we build uh, inefficient uh, economically and, and environmentally inefficient uh, supply chains within each and every um, state. And so, that is a little bit of an easier push, although the, the push in the consumer states is, um, is just as compelling. The reasons in the consumer states is just as compelling. Again, I mentioned the, the prospect of getting an industry up and off the ground with a stable supply chain in 12 to 18 months versus three to five to who knows how many years. Um, the idea that you will set up an industry that will survive federal legalization and not have to be totally reorganized once interstate commerce is a fact uh, under legalization. Um, we think are all uh, really important reasons, but we also think, um, you know, two of the key pieces are, are the environmental piece uh, and the, the insanity of growing uh, biomass at scale under lights and temperature control, um, you know, in, in places where it's expensive to do that and resource, resource intensive, uh, but also the idea that, um, that siloed markets are, a, are a, a real roadblock to equity and because most equity businesses are not, I mean, there, there's this idea that we're going to have a lot of small licenses, but initially for the first few years, you're going to have the large players who can get licensed first are going to be, are going to dominate supply and everyone else is going to be subservient to them. And if you're a retailer or delivery or distribution, you're going to have a very limited, uh, you're going to have very limited access to, to product to differentiate yourself. Whereas if we open up markets, suddenly thousands of small businesses will have access to thousands of the best suppliers in the country at levels of the trade that do not take $50 million to get into. And so it doesn't solve the problem, but it creates a pathway that with smart licensing, we can keep the industry in these states focused where it has really always historically been, which is small business and consumer facing. And that is the place. And if, and if economic power uh, is in the hands of all of those small businesses rather than a few large suppliers. Uh, that is a pathway to um, to actual real equity, uh, not sort of here are the crumbs uh, that you're going to you know wait for while you know GTI. And there's nothing wrong with big business. I want to be clear. Right. There's a place for big business in this in this industry, uh, but we don't have to we don't have to you know right now we are we are tilting the deck away from small business in each new consumer state that comes legal. Um, so we believe that the pressure is going to come from two governors asking the Justice Department for guidance. And once that happens, if we get guidance from the Justice Department, and Merrick Garland last week said legal cannabis is not a place where they're going to spend resources. Um, if we get guidance from the Justice Department saying states can move, governors can allow trade between them uh, if they regulate it, then it becomes almost impossible for the rest of the states to tell their their. Uh, you know, their voters, no, no, I know New Jersey is going to get Humboldt weed, you know, at the end of this year, but you're going to wait three to four years to get, you know, weed grown in Albany that's more expensive. Um, and so we think that once that hole in the, in the fence is, is created, uh, we'll have a cascade effect and we will get a rational multi-state market uh, that can start to set us up for a, a much more sustainable shift into federal legalization. So can I can I jump in there? And this is where Adam and I catch up. Like you know, he starts dark horsing because this is where the court cases come in. Um, the commerce clause, right? What is sustainability outside of the commerce clause? So when the commerce clause talks, um, and let's go to what that is. Even Gonzalez v. Rice. So in Gonzalez v. Rice, it is a California case. So let's understand the framework. Each jurisdiction in the country, broken down in the chips and congressional jurisdiction, also has. A federal jurisdiction court wise, and then it has a federal court of appeals before it goes to the Supreme Court. And so this California case was about interstate commerce and the Compassionate Compare Act in 2005, 
which looked at Congress's power to use the Commerce Clause to prohibit local cultivators um, to produce marijuana in compliance, even if it was in compliance with California law, because of the fear, one of the big holdings of the case, skipping ahead, <laughs> the fear that it's not gonna be able to be tracked in the diversion into illicit markets would spill over, right? So um, this this Compassionate Care Act was then looked at as negative starting in 05, and that's what started a lot of the Cali Wars and in terms of why some of the California activists are so great um, at what you guys do, because you've been dealing with it from a Ninth Circuit level for a, a long time. And so these activities go back, as I said, into a race context. And the last time the interstate commerce was used to be something, and when you go back to um, Hart v. Hotel Atlanta, this case is looking at actions taken by private businesses, by government entities that uh, affect uh, uh, civil rights issues, you know, race, discrimination, class-based uh, uh, items are subject to regulation by Congress. So by looking at the understanding that some of the issues that are happening here that Adam's talking about ownership, minority ownership, the lack of minorities to have vote verticals, the disparate impact of the war on drugs as it faces minorities. Todd mentioned Native Americans earlier, which is huge. The disparate impact on which it affects minorities and their inability to compete in this market is one of the big legal tenets. The big understanding that this idea that now that we're from 2005, and, and, and by the way, we're still following Nixon era laws. Can you guys imagine? And I don't, I don't, I, you know, political aside, you know, we're 50 years out. We got to make some changes. And so at the end of the day, when those politics come to play and you look at items that we're talking about sustainability and certifications, some of the certifications, tracking, technology, what we demanded from our society in 2005 to understand how to prevent illicit diversion into sub markets for cannabis, to, to, to look at why the Supreme Court said it was not, California was not allowed. We resolved that RFID tracking, this, that, and the third. Many states have robust programs and they're so good. Like in Oakland, the manufacturers from the legacy market are, are buying at the bit to get into the traditional market so they can pay taxes because they never wanted to be in their basement doing this shit anyway. And so, you know, being able to start looking at the effect of what certifications mean, the technology, to look at a court case and then step back against it and look at what the old tenants were and what the old holdings were and the old fears that spill over in the illicit markets is why a state like Oregon is so imperatively important because they were paying taxes and trash bags down in 2016, 2017. They managed to work past walking down the street to pay taxes and tax bags and have been leading the industry and have shown, no, there's not a whole bunch of spillage. Yes, there is tracking. Yes, we can have home growth. Yes, we can have nurseries and still have a market that's functional. Um, so that that's really where Adam and I start to spurn on where the cases matter um, to even where pa Todd is talking about the treaty policy. And then that gets back to what Jasmine was talking about. Well, who has the right to enforce what laws? If the police do not have the, the power to search and seize to stop based upon this industry of things, we can stop losing so much money. I thought this was stopped years ago anyway, but yet and still, I'm still dealing with cases with folks being raided and the rest. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Can I just jump back in for one second? I, I just want to say that's that's right. And the 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 legal precedent right now, the legal precedent, and it's been such for over a hundred years, um, is that even an industry that keeps everything within the state is participating already in interstate commerce constitutionally, and that and that right now the federal government has uh, the power, if they wanted to, to come in and shut down. The entire legal industry. There is no qualitative difference between, uh, you know, Oregon having its own industry and New York having its own industry and moving product between them, right? It's all we. The, the entire industry right now is functioning under the permission of a of a memo from the Justice Department, the Cole Memo, which no longer exists, right? There is no statutory um, permission for legal cannabis to exist in any state market, and. Um, and so what we are doing already violates uh, the CSA, the Controlled Substances Act. Um, it's everything. The, right, exactly. And, and, so, and so the Justice Department saying, hey, this is not going to be a priority for us as long as the states keep this under control is, is how we are operating now. And so getting that, um, you know, get, getting that permission, getting that acquiescence from the Justice Department uh, has been enough to build the entire industry and it, and it would be enough uh, for governors to be able to set up a regulatory framework to move product between legal markets. 
So forgive my ignorance here, but within a federal, I know we don't know what federal legalization yet looks like, but within a federal legalization, you know, uh, model is, is interstate trade included? Is that like just something you would think like, yes, states would be able to trade or federal legalization just says that all states are sort of allowed to make their own laws? It's question number no. one. Number two, you know, building off of that is um, within interstate trade is, are we only really talking about states that are, I know you said like California and New York, but what Jasmine was describing and, um, you know, Todd was describing was the challenges of different departments of transportation that could be federal different states that you're going to have to cross state lines. So are we only looking at things like Washington, California, Oregon, or Jersey, New York, things that have borders where you would be able to travel product a lot more e easily. There's a um, clause, uh, right? There's a clause called the Dormant Commerce Clause. That um, those are questions. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, the dormant Com commerce clause uh, basically gives commerce uh, Congress the uh, power over over interstate commerce, and so we have to uh, get some level, like Adam said, coal memorandum or some other uh, uh, clearance um, by the a federal. Uh, executive branch or, or legislative branch that allows us to, um, at the state level, make those decisions. Right now, states don't have the power to govern interstate commerce. That has to be a federal policy. I mean, they're, 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 the, the, the one and two of that, um, even, that, even as you're, you're asking where, where is the authority at, that's where the hammer is. You know, there, there's billions of dollars now tied up in industry. It's kind of like Bitcoin. It's just across cross borders. China deregulated, re-regulated Bitcoin to what it was back in 2017. From now until 2017, 2020, 2017, uh, 2021, excuse me, we've seen a $1.7 billion Chinese uh, uh, Bitcoin things, if you follow that. They released regulations in 2017, from 2017, saying no Bitcoin, no bans, no social use of that currency, kind of like a Controlled Substances Act of Bitcoin. Let's just say it like that. Um, you can trade a coin for a coin, but you can't trade a coin for a fiat, money, a dollar, um, a yen. And so when you cross over and say, well, the same thing with the coal memo, 2016 kind of memo, which gives a little bit of leeway for folks to establish the understanding of a market cap. So now you say $1.7, $1.9 billion invested in cannabis. Tomorrow, somebody gets pissed off and goes back and says, this poses a threat to national security or a threat to national markets using the case, uh, with, let's see, Perez, uh, what's Perez? Uh, total incidents, that's uh, Wilk Wilkert and Philburn. If it has a total incidence to a market from inter international Mexico, one move where the United States government is not getting attacked, just like Bitcoin, where the understand how to do the banking out and do some different just point and, and really all the dollars that the state side all the way are then in because the one authority even is as in if we do Brandon you're cutting yeah. off yeah I was going to chime in and ask if anyone else was having trouble hearing him. Can you hear me now? Yep. Sorry. Thank you. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to pass it back to Adam, but one problem, as he's saying, is, is, is where the issue is. So that's why certifications matter. And I want to cut, cut to the cheese for you, Adam, because if you can't verify that you're doing business clean, you're doing it not just in a re relation to the states, but cross states. One state is not going to certify that you're doing business good enough with them for another state. You got a foreign register. So whatever stamp matters, whatever stamp of good certificate, whatever generally accepted rubrics that states can use to coalesce more businesses now into engaging in that trade, before that hammer comes down by the federal government, people oh, it's not coming, it's not coming. If they can't tax it, it's coming. And in 2003, when I went to Iraq and got all these injuries that I have, I'm jumping out of planes and all the stuff that I had to do, um, and, and, and the United States government decided to patent cannabidiol as a newer protectant 
So they own the patent in 2003. So it's not a, a if or when or how, it's how do they get paid and where do they get paid from? I was I was just going to jump in and, and just to answer your first question, Zach, um, when federal legalization happens, the Constitution requires that states allow product from other legal markets into their market under the same regulations that they allow homegrown products to be in their market. Right. The only industries that states are allowed to keep other industries out of right in the country are banking and insurance. Right. All products. Um, function under the Dormant Commerce Clause, which means that the states do not have the right to say, oh, no, cal you know, no cannabis from outside or no wine from California or any of that, right? So federal legalization automatically brings interstate commerce constitutionally. Um, and in terms of the, the, the transport, um, you know, obviously we're talking about doing this under some sort of federal uh, permission, whether that's uh, through, a, through the Department of Justice or through uh, congressional approval of an interstate compact uh, or other statute. Uh, once the feds have decided they are not going to uh, get in the way of this and they're going to let the governors regulate it, um, we can move product uh, by train or by air to start if necessary because those are federally regulated and it stays out of the problem of getting some, you know, Yahoo sheriff in Idaho uh, or Texas pulling over a truck. Um, but we're pretty convinced that once we get multiple states and governors, um, you know, moving product around the country, we will be able to uh, work out with other states the transit through them. Uh, but we can we can start it by by using transportation that is federally regulated because we have to start with uh, federal permission to get it done. So, and one of the things I want to push back to Jasmine too is the understanding that there always exists multiple levels of this market. As we talked about earlier, cannabis is food, cannabis is medicine, cannabis is recreational. Just because you can take a medicine and it makes you feel good doesn't mean it's not medicine, right? Um, just because you can eat it and not have a negative effect doesn't mean it's not healthcare. And so some of the ways that, you know, Jasmine works for different companies to protect them and understanding what markets are not at risk from opening up interstate trade and which ones are. A lot of people have a lot of misconceptions that, oh, well, the medical is going to go away. There's no need for any medicine, all this crazy stuff, right? That's not sustainable. Jazz, can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. So the city of LA decided to not grant um, medical use licenses, right? So when we're talking about of interstate commerce with medical states, um, the city of LA wouldn't allow my license to participate in that um, in that program, although my the state would allow me. So there's there's that um, miscommunication between states and municipalities of how we can interact with the medical programs. And in my opinion, you know. A, a lot of the hype around the adult use market has um, per, it persuaded a lot of elected officials to go that route because they thought that would somehow encompass both. But we know that recreational and medical markets are, are two very different markets that have two very different needs, although the product could be the same product. But the service that that goes to that consumer is very different. Um, and there's a lot of um, it, more opportunities when it comes to the medical market. When we look at countries like Mexico, who are a lot of their legislation is around medical growth and, med and scientific investigation. Well, Unfortunately, the medical programs in states that have legalized um, for medical use are not a par to what Mexico regulations would look like. And unfortunately, we cannot do business with them because our standards, our quality control, our certifications are not valid in a country like Mexico. And I think that is a disadvantage for us given that we're, you know, we're from California and we're a very attractive market. However, when we look at the fine print, our medical program is not what the, the international markets have been, um, 
have perceived for all these years, right? And and I think that that is something we need to focus on. That is something we need to change. Um, I, I think also the medical market takes away a lot of the stigma that um, the adult use market brings when we're talking about bigger opportunities in business. And um, it, it is something that I advocate for. I think that it, it has opened up a lot of doors. Um, and I, I do want to strive to be able to do business with countries like Mexico. And um, I, I look forward to, to um, California embracing that opportunity and empowering operators to be able to to stand in those opportunities and, and take advantage of them yeah and, and building on that um that i think it's really important for us to get ahead of the curve um, when it comes to federal legalization and establishing uh, a framework for a commissioner or some kind of regulatory body that uh, uh kind of govern the the pedigree as i can see yuri asking your your question about federal pedigree and how that could come into play and and you know bounce people out that are smaller players in the in the space similar to the the pharma industry and so if we had a commission that could work on legislation and regulations that uh kind of remove those barriers and uh paid attention to cannabis as a a medicine um, shout out to Dr. Rachel Knox. I know she was on here earlier. She screamed at me about uh, not about making sure that you know the difference between recreational and, 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 and medicinal cannabis is a regulatory framework. It's not different products, and so we need to pay attention to that and advocate for uh, research to be done and um, set up a framework that doesn't bar people from uh, participating in the market when they don't have uh, the same same level uh, pedigree as someone with billions of dollars that can fund those types of endeavors. So I think the, the government has to take responsibility for that and understand uh, uh, how to create a framework that's equitable. And at the end of the day, uh, like I said, um, us here and um, folks across the country come together and uh, start to lay out that framework. And maybe that's something we could take on at MCBA uh, to make sure that um, once federal legalization is is real, uh, we have a framework in place. Yeah, totally awesome. Thank you, everyone. Can I can I top um, that last one? Last last one, and it, sure it, it goes right there. So when we talk about the the one of the things about jobs, right? Economy is based upon productivity. Economics are a little peak, little peak, like karate kick, <laughs> little peak. Um, economics all about productivity. So if we protect the people that are producing in the market through specific classes, then we help make sure the market is protected, right? So by having different minority certifications, CBE, MBEs, certifications for operators, people who come through the best of the best training and are certified businesses, certified, qualified, that have the proper equity formulas, that have the proper um, ownership structures, that have the proper corporate co social responsibility and pushing those companies to the top, you know, that does help, you know, when you look at uh, a stamping and getting this market opened up. Of course, once it really happens, if the governors look and say, hey, your company can't participate in this trade with our company, com country, uh, with our state, if you're not diverse, if you don't represent what our state represents, which is diversity in this market, including, you know, ownership and, and, and female minority, uh, Latin America, the, the entire gamut. And then understanding that that may be different in a medical, you know, space than it is just in a recreational operational space. And then that being different from an industrial use and cannabis being an industrial use space that needs all those barriers taken away for them to research and brand and grow at scale for product that you'll never look at, you know, consuming the smoke or whatever to make bricks like they do at the University of uh, Virginia Tech. So sorry about that. No, don't have to be sorry. Love your input and insight. Um, so I want to just like move on and ask one more question for you. And, and just a reminder, if you're in the audience and you have any questions, uh, you can pose them in the chat or the Q&A function. Um, so uh, we've seen re recently some of major corporations outside of cannabis, beverage industry, food industry, people starting to put forward plans for regenerative agriculture, not necessarily because um, it they're they just want to do better in the world but because they've seen without 
more responsible agricultural practices, their supply chain is going to dwindle, hence affecting their bottom line. And we've seen Pepsi Cola come out. We've seen Anheuser Busch uh, come out and say they're building their own facility to reuse their spent grain. Um, we're seeing mayors uh, commit to climate pacts about carbon uh, reduction, carbon sequestration. Um, obviously, climate change is one of the biggest topics we're all going to face, yet the way uh, our industry is unfolding is not necessarily uh, too in tune with that. We see, you know, again, the emergence of indoor grows uh, everywhere that are super energy intensive. Yes, we have LED lights coming down. It's like the emergence of Bitcoin um, and all these digital currencies. We're also seeing the conversation around energy utilization through the trading of that becoming a major issue. Elon Musk just brought it up. My question for you is, with all the mayors right now across the country who are really um, pushing for uh, commitments to climate uh, change, to carbon uh, sequestration and reduction, do you see that as a leverage point in, um, in, in pushing the argument for interstate trade or for federal legalization? And uh, are there people that you're working with in that realm, just trying to bring that more to the you know, earth sustainability climate focus? Any, any insight into that? I can talk about what's happening in California at a local level. Um, there's this organization called Pay It Forward. It's a hemp um, construction uh, teaching curriculum. And this uh, teaching curriculum has partnerships with the Community College of Oxnard. And what this group of people are doing is um, going down to Something that I, I, I didn't understand in the hemp space was that hemp isn't even registered as a usable product um, within the California code um, for general construction. And that includes having to do um, different types of uh, pilot programs, different types of research and development so that that specific product can in turn be used in construction codes across California. Um, and the obstacles that comes with that is that your planning departments are a local um, government agency. So it is a lot of work that, that this group has been doing um, from going to target municipalities that have um, heavy agricultural uh, demands and have heavy agricultural interest in the cannabis space and taking that um, that research and that product and in turn teaching government officials and, and different municipalities on their benefits, right? But it's, it, the second fold is actually doing the work of registering this product so that anyone across California can use it for construction. And it's my understanding that that process alone can take anywhere from 10 to 20 years to be inducted into a usable product for construction. So it, again, we're, we're in the beginning and uh, or the beginning of this revolution, but I absolutely think that it is the way. I think everyone on this panel and everyone that's listening in is a firm believer that that cannabis can ignite that climate change we've all been yearning for, um, but it, it is going to take time. Do we have that time based on science? I'm not sure. Um, is there ways to speed it up? Probably um, once we get through this red tape, it should be fairly easy, but it we need more um, hands on deck that can help process these, these um, these programs into workable policy. I can also see that uh, leveraging the concept that uh, power usage, water usage, environmental impacts and all that kind of stuff on the Eastern uh, or Mid-Atlantic coast and all that may uh, eventually be a, a big draw on uh, the resources on this side. And so maybe opening up some of that uh, trade from uh, uh, states that have better climates or more uh, amenable climates to uh, cannabis would uh, limit or reduce the amount of the, the impact 
on um, you know uh, the the environment. And I also think that um, you know organizations like Lead uh, can come in and ensure certifications of uh, facilities, and 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 uh, you know those can be put into licenses to uh, ensure that the points are um, are measured off of the sustainability of, of your buildings and um, the, the, the design that people put together. So I think that's a ultra, ultimately an interesting concept that we can uh, continue to explore. Yeah, I, yeah. I was, I'm sorry. I, I was going to add, I, I was going to add on that, you know, about two weeks ago, a study came out from the, from uh, Arizona state university saying that, uh, that the state of Arizona is um, is going through their uh, water table much faster than they understood um, that the rules that they had in place for water usage were uh, sort of erroneously put together and that they're um, you know in real trouble heading forward with water usage and yet they're about to um, you know they're about to create uh, a, a cannabis production industry to, to, to meet the demand of almost eight million people um, that's relatively water intensive um, and so, and again, it's a, it's a, it's a production industry that the minute federal legalization happens, uh, will likely become non-competitive anyway. Um, and so the, the idea of walking in and saying, look, it's, it's environmentally irresponsible, right. To be growing this here, there is nothing agriculturally that grows at commercial scale in every part of the country. It's not how agriculture works. Stuff grows where it grows and it's moved to markets where there's most demand. And so, um, and so in a state like Arizona or states with high energy costs, or bad energy mixes where most of their energy comes from uh, fossil fuels, um, you know, to, to put that into competition, even temporarily with a state that can grow biomass outdoors and in greenhouses uh, is, is environmentally irresponsible to do. And we are hoping that uh, more of the uh, environmental community, uh, you know, will stand up and we're starting to work with them to stand up and say, hey, you know, we know you think that there's a lot of jobs in building these giant production factories, but, um, but they're temporary jobs. And, and again, it's environmentally responsible to do it. And there's no reason. I want to, I want to take a drop back even deeper. So let's go to the origin of, of things. Why even at this level, are states going so hard, right. To force everyone inside, you know, if you get to the East coast, outdoor growth, unheard of, right. Not that they can't, you know, I think, you know, Vermont, some places got some really hot sun, Eastern shore, Maryland, Carolina, surely can grow things. Um, but when it comes down to the why, the fear, the fear of, of this being lost or, or commingled or whatever the case may be, outweighs people's um, sense of um, environmental need. I mean, we just went through a gas crisis here in, in this side of the world. Um, you know, as soon as they said, don't get gas, just everybody did. You know, it's like, hey, don't get gas because we need a few days to reset and get it done. And everybody went out to get gas. You could not move it entirely uh, shut down. And it's very quick. It was very scary um, to see how quickly things can get out of control um, with, with, with the failures of, of folks to understand the safeguards. But that being said, one of the biggest reasons we're inside growing a lot of things is because of the fear of this getting outside and then derelict into, into the, the, the commerce stream. And then the next, um, you look at it and say, well, even though some states don't want to compete on agriculture and the jobs, they do want to compete on taxes. So I think in, in California and stuff, you can buy, you know, alcohol in the grocery store or whatever, however you guys got to tax, right, on uh, the way it's set up. But if you're in North Carolina, you got to buy that from the ABC store. And that's been that way and will be that way. And so, you know, the way that this works out and what states are allowed to tax what, import how, and you know, if they're able to say, okay, we can fulfill this need by importing this much and, and tax it um, to help reduce the need on it, isn't going to reduce greed, isn't going to reduce the, the foolish tendencies of people that rush out to buy all the gas up when they say don't get any gas. Absolutely. Well, I encourage all of you working on this movement to think about the mayor's alliances for climate change in their cities as advocates for you know, building that sustainable industry in the interstate. Um, we have about two or three minutes left. Um, uh, maybe just go around Adam and uh, we'll go around the circle, maybe closing remarks, uh, things you, you know, maybe, maybe some intentions you wish for this industry as it relates to a sustainable interstate trade. And then we'll, uh, we'll close it up. And then we have another panel coming up right after this. Uh, yeah, I guess you said me, so I'll go, I'll go first. Um, 
you know, we're in this rush to create this industry and we have, uh, you know, we have built it in a way that tries to uh, cross the chasm between federal prohibition and state regulation. Um, and in doing that, uh, we have set up um, we have set up a system that allowed us to operate uh, before the federal government was really happy about it uh, and, you know, sort of stay out of there, stay under the radar by a little bit arbitrarily choosing these state silos as the line we wouldn't cross. Uh, but again, there's no difference under federal law. What we're doing, even in state siloed industries, is entirely illegal. Um, and so thinking about this industry in a way uh, of what it will be, of what the future of the industry is, and getting it set up so it's economically sustainable, in addition to environmentally sustainable, and also in a way that is not artificially set up to uh, hand the industry over to a small number of, of relatively large players while everyone else waits for them um, you know, to grow cannabis at scale in places where it, it shouldn't be grown uh, is, is something that is very short-sighted. Uh, and because we don't know the final date of federal legalization, um, it, is, it, it creates misincentives for people to invest a lot of money into production that will not be ultimately competitive. And, and the last thing I would say is that uh, it is vitally important that while there is place for, in this industry for large businesses, that this business is broadly beneficial. It is an industry that has been a small business industry for generations uh, and, and empowering small business rather than large, uh, you know, huge players by, by artificially protecting them is a, is a huge impediment to uh, social equity. And, you know, if you're in this industry and you have your fingertips on the bag of gold, and you're reaching for it, you need to know that the only reason you can touch that bag of gold is because you're standing on a mountain of 80 years of ruined lives and destroyed communities. And if we are not accountable to that, and if we are not ending prohibition with integrity, uh, then we are profiteering off of that suffering. And so uh, thinking about interstate commerce as a way to create a rational market that allows uh, folks to get in and provide states the pathway to license in a way uh, that is gonna have integrity. Can't, I mean, can't, can't say better than that, can you? I mean, right, drop the mic. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe we'll end on that one. I told you talking after him, and people think I'm always- I think, I think maybe we'll, we'll, we'll end on that. We, uh, we have another panel coming up. First of all, um, Adam, Jasmine, Brandon, Todd, thank you so much. Uh, your insight into this was really uh, incredible. I am so fascinated by this topic ever since meeting Adam years ago and uh, look forward to getting to know you all more. Everyone in the audience, thank you for joining us. We have our last panel coming up, standout social equity programs that states are proposing and implementing. That's going to be in the other conference room. So make your way over from this room to the other one using our website. That'll include Colin Wells from Veterans Walk and Talk, Austin Stevenson from Bertosa, Jessica Gonzalez from Minorities for Medical Marijuana, Margot Bruner from Perpetual Harvest Sustainable Solutions, and Natalie Papillon from The Last Prisoner Project. Uh, that's going to be the end of our uh, the last uh, panel for this two-day sustainability symposium. I love the, uh, the dual por porch action going on over there. Looks like a beautiful day. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you, everyone else. Uh, we will see you uh, in the next room. Thank you, everyone. All right now.